Welcome to our panel discussion broadcast live from the KC Irving Center Auditorium at Acadia University. My name is Dr. Michael Shepard of the Manning School of Business here at Acadia, and today's discussion will be around the question, how can Acadia and community grow its innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem? We'll take audience questions on, later on in the discussion, but you can tweet in questions at any time. Just include the hashtag pound startup AU. That's startup AU for Acadia University. The first place in Canada that normally comes to mind when we think about innovation and entrepreneurship is the Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge area. Regardless of what's happened to research and motion or RIM in the last year, Canada's technology triangle continues to thrive. So what is it about this region that makes it so special? And can it be replicated elsewhere? For example, right here at Wolfville, Nova Scotia. To help kick off the discussion on this timely and important topic are Victoria Lennox, CEO of Startup Canada, Paul Richards, Business Development Consultant at Innovacorp, Lee Hustis, Director of Industry and Community Engagement at Acadia, and Duncan Ibada, Senior Marketing Student, Entrepreneur and Coordinator at the Center, Acadia Centre for Rural Innovation. During my preparation for this discussion, I found that one of Ontario's leading broadcasters, Steve Pakin of The Agenda, hosted a discussion around this topic just last month. This was, this was prompted by their concern over the effect that RIM's decline might have had on the economy of the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Their conclusion was that the ecosystem of, of entrepreneurship and innovation was established long before RIM, long before RIM came to Waterloo and to a large extent related to a culture of, of cooperation. Though competition exists, it's not about undoing the competitors, but more about who will hit their benchmarks or goals first. They explained that there's often little overlap of products and markets within the clusters of high-tech companies who compete in the global marketplace rather than with their neighbors. The panelists suggested that the 1950s notion of dog-eat-dog -dog competition may be a thing of the past and that a culture of cooperation may, the, may be the key for Canada to become the next innovation nation. One important question that came out of the discussion was, is it possible to replicate what has been developed in the technology triangle elsewhere in Canada? The answer was yes, but it would likely be unique to the, com the community involved. So the question for the panel then, particularly now that we have Acadia Centre for Rural Innovation, is how do we do that? Before we dig into the topic, maybe we need to step back a bit and deal with some of these words though. Victoria, let's start with entrepreneurship and innovation. What do they mean and is one more important than the other? Can you help us clarify that a bit? Okay, well, thank you, Michael. Um, I, I'm going to start really textbook here. So entrepreneurship is traditionally, traditionally the capacity and willingness to develop and organize a company, so start a business venture, along with uh, any, uh, thinking about any profit of generating a company. But entrepreneurship really ranges in, in scale from solo entrepreneurs all the way to major companies. But in more recent times, what we've seen and what you see in Waterloo is that it's come, come really down to entrepreneurship as a mindset, so something that you can uh, have as a, uh, as a philosophy, a way of being, a way of acting. So there's entrepreneurship in the terms of business creation, but there's also entrepreneurship in terms of the way you think and being entrepreneurial. But innovation, that, that, that comes from the, from the Latin word um, to renew or change. It's about deriving something new, reviving something, changing something. It's a new product, idea, service. Both are essential. So I'd say both entrepreneurship and innovation are essential, and it's the fusion of the two that really create high growth companies and uh, anchor companies that we can build our economy on. But just before I pass it back to you, I just wanted to make a few remarks about entrepreneurship and innovation. So I don't know how many people in the room here have been following, but there's been recently a Jenkins panel. And the Tom Jenkins panel, Tom Jenkins is the founder of Open Text, awesome company in Waterloo. And his panel found that there's a major gap in Canada in terms of innovation and that we're lagging behind other developing countries. Ultimately, innovation is the source of long-term competitiveness of business and the quality of life of Canadians. But we know that entrepreneurship uses innovation. Entrepreneur innovation is a tool of entrepreneurs. So Peter Drucker, those of you studying business here, you'll know that Drucker says that innovation is a specific instrument of entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs use innovation in order to uh, uh, uncover new markets and services. 
But Ilse Turnick at Mars, the Mars Discovery District in Toronto, she says that without entrepreneurs, great ideas will never come to the marketplace. So innovation without entrepreneurship is insufficient. So they are symbiotic. So if we think about the fact that we know that prosperity depends on innovation, and we know that innovation is a tool that entrepreneurs employ, and that entrepreneurs really belong in Canada and create the, 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 the economy and the social fabric of, of our country, then we see that we need to create ecosystems um, that we see in the, in the Waterloo Tri-City area uh, to support the seamless flow of entrepreneurship and, and, and innovation. So I think that's a really good way to start, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you've, you've, you've used the word symbiotic, you've used the word ecosystem. Um, our friends in the in biology department down the street would probably be wondering why we're using those terms in, in reference to business. Yeah, well, um, entrepreneurship itself is much more than uh, economic activity. It's a highly social activity. Um, anyone who knows an entrepreneur, are there any entrepreneurs in the room? Awesome. If you know an entrepreneur, if you are an entrepreneur, you know that entrepreneurship is a high contact sport and it requires that you collide with other people. Um, so um, uh, in, in terms of collisions, you need different team players, you need people with different skills, expertise, resources that contribute to the growth of your venture. You can't do it alone as an entrepreneur. So using and pulling from the word ecosystem that they might be using in biology, uh, that's the old school way of using them. Um, uh, the, the word ecosystem. It really is an ecological metaphor. It suggests that a firm, a company, an entrepreneur is embedded in a business environment in that it needs to co-evolve with other companies and other stakeholders. This means that companies need to be proactive in developing the community around them and developing mutually beneficial relationships with others in, in, in the ecosystem. So that's kind of where the parallel comes with this concept of ecosystem. Now Babson College in the States, they've identified a number of parts of this ecosystem that any entrepreneur needs to be aware of as they build their companies, uh, whether it's policy, regulations, finance, culture, support, human capital, and markets. These are different domains, and within these domains, you'll find different stakeholders, like incubators. You'll find the university, Acadia University, in there. You'll find support structures and accelerators and clusters. So the word ecosystem captures perfectly this social living evolving nature of what's needed to support high growth entrepreneurship and innovation. So I think that's really where it comes from. Excellent, thank you, Victoria. Uh, so now we understand a bit more about what we're talking about when we say um, an ecosystem of, of entrepreneurship and innovation. Perhaps um, we need to get a bit better picture of what's been happening in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Now I know, Victoria, you've spent some time there doing research. Um, can you give us a brief rundown on what they're doing there? Yeah, um, to begin with, the KW Entrepreneurship and Innovation Ecosystem, it, it didn't happen overnight. It's 30 years in the making. So what you see today and what you know of, if you know of the Waterloo Innovation Ecosystem, it's taken a long time to cultivate, so we can't really take that for granted. But just to give you a bit of context, I launched a startup, or a, a nonprofit startup, called Startup Canada in May. And what we've been doing is we've been going across the country visiting entrepreneurial communities across Canada. And one of those 40 communities was Waterloo. And so the, our visit to Waterloo in May is kind of the basis for my remarks here. We met with all of the community leaders that were driving forward change and building this ecosystem in Waterloo. Um, so for those of you who have been to Waterloo Region, another show of hands, how many people have been to Waterloo Region? Awesome. So you'll know that this community is on fire with entrepreneurship and innovation. You can feel it when you're walking down the street. With RIM, without RIM, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, uh, there's something special going on in Waterloo Region, and it sounds like this is what we're trying to cultivate here um, at Acadia University. So while the dynamics of any ecosystem are really, really complex, I'm just going to highlight very quickly seven elements that I think really make Waterloo stand out and elements that I believe brought Waterloo to where it is today. And I'll start with the one that I think is really important, and I think that's leadership and vision. Um, and, but leadership and vision not from policymakers or government or, 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 or um, uh, from the academic sector. It was really leadership from entrepreneurs themselves who stepped up and led the way in the development of this ecosystem. So I think that Waterloo is working because entrepreneurs were leading the way. I think that enterprise support organizations are feeders of the system, and when they become leaders, things get broken. So uh, I, I think a lesson here from Waterloo for Acadia University is put entrepreneurs um, at the front of this initiative and get them to lead the way in, in cultivating this ecosystem, and they'll, they'll put their money where their mouth is if they really, really believe in it. 
they have a grassroots culture of entrepreneurship. And, and when I talk about grassroots, I mean at the student level. In Waterloo, they have Waterloo University, the University of Waterloo, they have Wilfrid Laurier University, they have Conestoga College, but all of the students are really highly engaged in the ecosystem. They're part of student clubs, they're building ventures on campus, they're in the accelerators. So students uh, play a huge role in not just being part of the ecosystem, but helping to fuel it. They lead student clubs. Um, they do um, really cool things. Um, I can't um, stress enough the importance of the university and the colleges, the two universities and the colleges in this structure. Um, even if you look at Stanford's entrepreneurship ecosystem or Cambridge's entrepreneurship ecosystem, the university plays an, a critical role in, in liaising and engaging with, with the community um, in a way that where text transfer flows seamlessly and graduates are recruited into startups. And it just creates a, a symbiotic, again, ecosystem that, um, that supports entrepreneurship and innovation in high growth companies. So that's number three. So the first was leadership and vision. The second was grassroots culture. The third was education. But when I asked the, the president of the University of Waterloo, why is Waterloo really working? Or if I asked Governor General David Johnson, why is Waterloo working so far along the way? They say it's because their entrepreneurial networks are underpinned by innovation. And so when entrepreneurship is underpinned by innovation, that's when we can really um, uh, get some really exciting things moving. Something that I think uh, Acadia University also has and, and shares with Waterloo is just such a global community across the campus. This campus is full of students from all over the world. When, when it, it doesn't matter how big or how small the institution is, if we can leverage that global community and create those global ties to new markets, that's fantastic. And sharing those cultural experiences. Of course, Waterloo has anchor companies. That's one, that one's a bit more difficult to come by. They have RIM, they have Open Text, now they have Google. Um, having, developing these anchor company linkages, that's a bit tougher, um, but it's something that, can be sh uh, that we can strive towards. The reason why these anchor companies are critical is they hire graduates, they train graduates, they invest in companies, they create incubators, they invest in academic programs. And so that's something we see in, in Waterloo, and I think it's a, we're, we're already seeing it here at Acadia, and I think we just need to um, invest a bit more time in looking how we can engage with industry. And I think uh, good steps are being taken. And, and, and the last point here is time, and I started with, with time. It, it takes time to develop an entrepreneurship ecosystem. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a labor of love, and it requires an entire community mobilizing around one idea. Everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet, and that's what you really have in Waterloo. But at its very foundation, what permeates the entire Waterloo system, just to conclude, is the culture, a culture of mentorship and collaboration. So many communities that we visited across Canada, there's a lot of politicking between organizations. People aren't working together. In Waterloo, doors wide open, how can we help, um, is usually the response that you're met with if you're looking to access support or meet somebody. So the message that Waterloo would have for the rest of Canada is leave your ego at the door, lay down your swords, and come together to build a startup community. The KW ecosystem, for um, the KW ecosystem celebrates its entrepreneurs, celebrates its repeat entrepreneurs, celebra celebrates the entrepreneurs who failed. Um, they celebrate learning from mistakes, trying new things, sending the elevator back down once you've been successful for the next generation. So for, for entrepreneurs in Waterloo, they want to give back because they know that their success came from the cumulative efforts of those around them, their mentors, their investors, their educators, their incubators. It's a self-reinforcing system. So what, what, what we can learn from Waterloo, well, we can learn that it takes leadership and vision um, combined with a grassroots culture that fuses education and innovation with private industry whilst leveraging global markets and networks. So it takes the commitment and a culture of collaboration and mentorship but of course, also, it takes time. Some very powerful and useful observations, Victoria. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I think we'd all agree that uh, we're not starting from scratch here at Acadia and, and in Wolfville, and we can build on our strengths um, to begin establishing that type of ecosystem here. Um, for Paul, Paul, perhaps you could um, talk about some of the su success stories that have come out of the area up to now. Yeah. Uh, the area has developed uh, a strong entrepreneurial environment, um, perhaps unlike some of the tech areas that have been identified, um, uh, Waterloo and area. We have primarily focused our economic development strategy on more traditional industries. Mm -hmm. And 
over the last 10, 10 years, we've been very successful with uh, productivity and competitiveness on more of a traditional industry sectors. And if you look at the, the sectors such as the apple industry or the wine industry, we're seeing dynamic uh, innovation taking place in those traditional sectors. Mm -hmm. So those entrepreneurs are operating within existing uh, sectors and, and they're looking at world-class research applied to, to, their, to their area, tapping into university resources or uh, research stations, uh, agricultural research stations to become world-class in that area. Uh, it, entrepreneurs are investing in their own business and they're feeling capable and, and positive about what their, their future prospects are. So they're taking a different business um, approach to traditional, uh, traditional sectors like agriculture. So we're seeing a lot of productivity and competitiveness on a global scale in some of these traditional industries, which other areas in Atlantic Canada haven't been able to do. So in that sense, we have these, these kind of anchor industries that give us a little stability. Um, but we're also looking at developing the knowledge-based economy, and as spoken earlier, they're, they're some of the businesses that have scalability, the ability to have hyper-growth, gazelles or um, high-growth rate firms. And we're starting to see the evolution of these. And we can look at examples like Live Lens um, that started here, they're looking at um, in the restaurant industry, they provide um, management data, um, and they have been able to already have start establishing some um, venture capital funds and uh, looking at a really Scalable, scalable business model. So we're starting to see some businesses like that. Even in the maybe even the traditional industries, yeah, if anyone hasn't seen it, um, sustainable fish farming in Upper Burlington. If you haven't been to Upper Burlington, you should go to Upper Burlington. Don't don't blink. You might drive <laughs> through, but there's a dynamic, world-class um, aquaculture, land-based aquaculture. That's one of a kind, the first in, in the world where it's totally self-sustaining. So it's 100% self-sustaining. So that's world-class technology that is unique to this area and being developed in this area. Um, so we're starting to see the development of, of, of these knowledge-based businesses. And that's at the, the, at the core, I think, where we try to maybe move to the next level of, of our entrepreneurship ecosystem. But if we're talking ecosystem, we have to start looking at you know, what is the ecosystem. And, and this area has, is in, in relation to proximity, relatively close to Halifax. And if we're looking at a dynamic entrepreneurial environment. Halifax has begun to develop a real strong reputation and the, the, the global venture capital markets and the global markets are really looking at what's taking place in Halifax and there's a lot of newly minted millionaires in Halifax because of their innovation and technology. So it's really becoming a hot spot and for this area if we're looking at what is the ecosystem and, and, and we talk about economic zones and how do we in this area, this rural area that can we ever be a, a true cluster? Can this area of 50,000 people of Kings County, or do we become a component, and, and is it realistic to think of ourselves as the larger economic zone of Halifax and greater area? And how do we create those synergies um, so that we are a, a key component of what's taking place and that, that key buzz that's taking place in, in Halifax? Um, so that was, we're not starting at square one. We mm -hmm. have a lot of momentum going. In the history, and, and one only has to look at uh, minus pulp and paper, minus, minus pulp and power, and see a hundred years of some of the most world-class innovation um, in a number of sectors. Exactly. Sounds like a good starting point. Um, as I mentioned, the discussion is timely. The, uh, the reason is Acadia just recently announced the um, Center for Rural Innovation. Um, Lee, can you give us a bit, bit of background on how that came into being and, and just a bit about of it, its uh, mission and uh, goals? Sure. Um, and we aren't officially open yet, I'll just okay. throw out that proviso. Um, although certainly the funding announcement was made a few months ago and renovations are complete. So within the next month or so, you'll be hearing a lot more about it. Um, maybe I can give you a bit more background on Acadia uh, itself and the innovation. Um, I head up the Office of Industry and Community Engagement. It used to be called the Office of Tech Transfer and Innovation. And for those of you not familiar with the whole tech transfer world, it's the idea of taking innovations that are developed at the university and uh, porting them out to the market. In many cases, licensing them out to companies. And Acadia has been tremendously innovative for the last decade in doing that. Uh, with the origin of the office, we were one of the first small universities in Atlantic Canada to actually put funding into such an office. 
And over the last 10 years, we've been successful licensing everything from a skating simulation product. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. That was actually licensed to uh, a team, NHL team here in Canada. I can't tell you who, but they're located in in a big city in Ontario. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's one example. We've also been very successful on the software side of things. So a lot of innovation taking place on campus. We have products that have been licensed to publishers and they're now being used throughout Canada. We have a software product that our library technicians developed that's being used at 60 universities around the world, including Oxford universities. Um, so very strong history of innovation. That, coupled with some changes that are taking place in government, uh, government funding, researchers that have traditionally looked to uh, pretty significant pools of pure funding to, to uh, fund their research programs, those are drying up to some degree. The governments are pushing researchers to work more closely with industry. So that's another element that's taking place. Um, we've also, over the last couple of years, uh, with a new administration, we've been refocusing our efforts, and indeed the office, we've changed the name of the office to the Office of Industry and Community Engagement. So we're now working much more closely, the research office within Acadia, working with industry partners, working with our local communities, working with industry sectors in this southwest area to see how we can help them grow, how we can contribute to the economic development. Um, and as an example, we've been working with the wineries very closely over the last couple of years, and we, we believe we've made very significant inroads with the wineries, who, by the way, need help on everything from how to develop an export strategy to how to get rid of some powder you know, sediment in their wines, so from the science to the business. And we believe we've made a pretty significant impact there. We now, we're, we were approached by Innovacor about a year and a half ago, and this is, I'm getting to the origin. It's almost a perfect storm, though, if you will. Novacor came and approached us and said, you know, would you consider uh, opening up an incubation facility on campus? And fortunately, our administration just jumped at the chance. We were able to secure funding and renovations took place. And in our discussions, we realized in order to be successful, we'd have to align ourselves very closely with a number of partners. One being the business school. We could find no better place on campus than to house this center uh, within the business school building Patterson Hall. Uh, similarly, we aligned ourselves with partners like Innovacor and Axby, realizing that we don't have all the expertise or the resources to run this facility, and uh, we want to make it successful. We've also aligned uh, with partners like the Entrepreneurs Forum to provide mentorship to some of the companies. Um, getting more into the mission, I, I should point out, while it's an incubation facility, that's only one of the, the key mandates, the incubation space itself of the facility. We want it to be an innovation hub for Southwest Nova Scotia. So whether you're housed in the facility, whether you're a company in the community who needs help, we want to be the one-stop shop where you can come and seek that help. Um, and Victoria made a comment at lunch, actually, um, that uh, it's hard for students um, and people in the community to know how to go about within the inner workings of the institution, how to go about and, and seek help. Who do you contact? And it's sometimes a little bit daunting, especially for people in the community. So we're trying to make inroads and, and make that more open and, and welcoming. Um, so the innovation hub, what we want to do is tie into some of the expertise here on campus. We talk about entrepreneurs and innovation. It's almost the separate dichotomy. Um, we have a lot of entrepreneurs. We have a lot of innovation here on campus. And what we want to do is match make those. We have uh, a lot of innovators on campus who aren't entrepreneurs who would like to be to be hooked up with entrepreneurs, a lot of faculty members, for example. Uh, we want to have access to financial support, which we'll achieve through folks like Innovacor and uh, First Angel Network, accounting, business support, those type of things, as well as emotional support when we can offer it. So uh, that's the mission and the mandate in a nutshell. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Duncan, I know you've been heavily involved in the center um, since, um, I mean, we even started thinking about doing that here, and I just wonder if you could tell us a bit about how, um, what that might mean for the students here at Acadia. Sure. Uh, I think it's, uh, well, I mean, it's a dream come true for any entrepreneur around campus. Um, you know, you have an idea and you need somewhere to go, that's where you can go. Um, and I think in, in the past, you know, uh, for some people who get really involved, they you know they go seek out Axby or they go seek out Lee, and um, and that you know they are great resources. But um, now we have you know a center with many different types of resources uh, that can um, 
you know, help people bring their idea to fruition. Uh, so for students, it could mean co-op jobs, it could mean starting their own company, it could mean uh, jobs after um, school, like Victoria was talking about, um, and, and just really real-world wor experience during their degree. Um, so that sort of, um, uh, you know, building the soft skills, the, the, uh, the average of soft skills, bringing it up at Acadia um, is, is the way I look at it. Um, entrepreneurial and soft skills, mm -hmm. that is. So, so that when they leave there, whether they're starting up uh, or going into a uh, business, they have the skills uh, to succeed. So an excellent opportunity for the folks in the audience here that are students at Acadia and those uh, viewing us on Twitter or, or on, um, on our um, uh, live feed. Um, now, going forward, I think it makes a sense to assume that um, this recently opened center um, will be a key component of the uh, ecosystem. So the question is then, how can we build on this momentum uh, and make best use of this ex excellent resource? Uh, Victoria, perhaps you could start us off in the discussion. Okay. Uh, well, it, it sounds to me like the Acadia Center for Rural Innovation could be really well placed to be ho the home for entrepreneurship here on campus for students and staff. And and for the key industry sectors across campus, whether whether it's the agri-food sector, or the ITC, or oceans technology, I, I, I think it could be the home that really brings it all together. But the question is, how do we build momentum around this center? That's really the question. So we have this center, we have this space, but space isn't enough. You need the community. And I think the answer to this question is, it, it comes down to the openness of the center and how, and, and, and you, you've uh, nailed it, Lee, how open is it to the community, to the students, um, and, and uh, how accessible is it? I think that the center needs to be a place for entrepreneurs in every sense of the word industry, students, researchers, and staff to come together around real life projects. And I think that all of us on the panel are really seeing the same thing with the center. So here are just a few ideas to kickstart. And maybe some of them have been started, but this is my first day at Acadia University, <laughs> so bear with me just a little bit. So um, I know that there's a business club on campus. Is there anyone here from the business club today or involved with the business club? I hear it's a rocking club. That's awesome. I think that um, what would be awesome is to have students play a large role in running, running the entire center um, at functionally and to get the student club involved. Um, I think that there should be incubation space, of course, for the students and hot desking space that people can hop in and out of and meet other people and collide with other ideas. I think that's important. I don't know if there is one, but entrepreneurs and residents in any incubator are awesome. These are entrepreneurs who are well-known, successful in the community, and they have office hours as entrepreneurs and residents in the incubator, so they can mentor other entrepreneurs. I think that would be fantastic, making sure that there's a diversity of these mentors and these entrepreneurs just floating around mm -hmm. at different times within the center. I think, though, that it won't work unless there's someone who's laser-focused on making it successful. I think there needs to be a community builder or a community animator, and maybe that's you, Lee, but maybe it's somebody else that connects with and engages all the departments on campus in increasing awareness and getting collaboration around the center so the center becomes this, this hurricane of activity and excitement. Um, and I think that we've heard already some of the successes of the region of Acadia University but what I don't feel is that enough is being done to celebrate those successes from what I've seen online and I've looked at Twitter feeds and um, I, I've looked at blogs. And I, I'm a social being who lives in the online world. And I think so much more could be done to celebrate successes, to showcase what's working, why Acadia University and, and why this center is really a hub for entrepreneurship in the region. We can do a lot of work like busy beavers in the background, but if we're not celebrating and letting the rest of the world know what's going on here. Um, I, I, did it really happen? It's kind of like, is the tree in the woods falls? Did it really, really? Yeah, you get where I'm going. So we need to give a strong brand to the center, I think. I think we need to celebrate its successes publicly. We need to develop significant media partnerships um, and genuine partnerships. We need to increase social media presence. So I love that this is live streamed and people can ask questions on Twitter. And we need to position the center at the forefront of rural innovation, not just here in Nova Scotia, not even in Atlantic Canada. Let's think bigger. Let's think globally. How can the Acadia Center for Rural Development become a global center of excellence in this space? 
bringing together entrepreneurship and innovation. So these are just a few ideas on how we can leverage the center to benefit the university, but, but also the entire region. So, so those are just some of my thoughts. Mm, great. Um, maybe, um, Lee, I, I know you, there was some back and forth there about um, you know, what, what can be done inside the, inside the center to, to get students involved and to keep this momentum going. Uh, do you, might you have anything to add on that? Um, yeah, no, we talked uh, earlier a little bit about the low-hanging fruit, and, and Duncan and I have spent some time talking about this, but we believe students will be really the key for the centre, as well as effective community engagement. Um, the idea of uh, low-hanging fruit is also uh, tied to uh, one of our early tenants in the centre. One, one item I forgot to mention is that uh, we believe that the centre is somewhat innovative in that we have really sort of has a, have a laser focus on certain key sectors. Um, that are key to the region. So tidal energy is one focus, ICT or IC, you know, IT software companies. And the other is agri-food. Um, not exclusive to other folks, but uh, we will try to encourage those kind of interactions whenever possible, simply because we have a vast amount of expertise here on campus, and those are sectors of key importance to our region. Um, so in light of that, we, we are developing relationships right now with some companies who we hope to attract to the center in the very short term, one of whom is here, John Reed, uh, for, uh, adjunct faculty member here on campus, and his company, Colibri uh, Software, is now resident in the facility. And when we talk about students getting involved in the center, John has been hiring between eight and ten students over the last few months. So that's an example of how key students will be to the center, not only for Colibri, but for other tenants who we hope to become engaged. Um, in the past, we've been very successful. K is a small university. We're very nimble. We can work very effectively with companies on and off campus, getting companies involved in, in everything from curriculum, hiring students, um, co-op placements, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So those are some other key ways. So even if companies aren't necessarily resident in the center, we they can still be partner companies and be involved in some of the activities in the center. Okay. Yeah. Um, Victoria, does it sound like that we're missing any pieces in this ecosystem that might prevent us from moving forward? And again, I've only been here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it sounds like there's this perfect coming together, really, of uh, all, all of these resources and stakeholders with this center, and I think this could be really exciting. And, and it, it, I, I know for current students, you're thinking, well, you know, I'm about to graduate. Um, well, um, the value of your university continues when you're an alumni, if your university is reputable. 30 years ago, if you studied at the University of Waterloo, you studied at the University of Waterloo. It was surrounded by farmland. You know, um, and, 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 and today um, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of recognition about the value of a, a degree from Waterloo. Um, and and what, what I would just say is that it sounds like there's the perfect coming together. That's great, but just from my perspective, which is a, a more a social science perspective, it. Um, it seems that what we need to do is put it on paper, develop a strategy and blueprint of how we're going to take this center to the next level and what the vision for the center is. It's great that the vision for the center is to bring together the ecosystem, but so what? We're going to bring together the ecosystem. How many new companies do we want to create? How many new jobs do we want to create? How many co-op placements? How many students do we want to engage? Um, do we want to be recognized as a center for excellence globally? Great. How many targets and, and, and global linkages are we looking to make? So um, I think it, everything sounds great. Well, I think what's needed is kind of a blueprint. <laughs> I've been using that word a lot today, but blueprint or action plan um, to kind of take the center from where it is today and really accelerate it. Not that you have to follow the plan, but that at least there's a plan. <laughs> I like the not following the plan. <laughs> you, it's like writing a business plan. You, yeah. you put it on paper and then you put it away and you just get exactly. on with it anyways. But it's there and it's something you can refer back to and, and know when you've achieved what you set out to. Mm -hmm. So the idea of having measurable goals Absolutely. that we can check off. Sounds good. Um, you mentioned the idea of anchor companies earlier. But then, Paul, you addressed it, I think, by saying that we have anchor industries versus yeah. anchor companies. Does that kind of translate? Is that one of the missing pieces that, that maybe one can substitute for the other? Yes, in some <laughs> ways. I think it's good, I think it's good to, um, when we're looking at the, the ecosystem, to look at 
we are products of our environment and we, we model. Um, so if we have successful industries and within those industries, businesses that provide stability. If you look mm -hmm. at the Apple industry, there's large players that, that give that, glo that, glo that allow the industry to be a global uh, player. Mm -hmm. And that gives a model for other sectors. So we can start modeling and looking at the environment. When we start, and that's wonderful, especially around the traditional industries. So different industries, can, in, in, in this case, the agricultural industry, can start modeling and, and building um, similarities, some scalability around that. But when we're looking at the knowledge-based economy, kind of that uh, growth oriented business, um, it's really important to have anchor business because they provide some stability and they provide some training and we see businesses spinning out of, of that and um, having a, a, a successful startup and growth firm, a lot of times that creates, uh, it, uh, acorns fall from that, mm -hmm. from that and that's where new startups often fall and it becomes a, a lineage to uh, one of those anchor tenants. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're looking at the high growth technology area, yeah, it certainly helps having community of those, because that's where we start seeing some, some synergies taking place. Right, I see. Okay, um, one point that um, came up in the discussion I referred to earlier was um, that whether the model uh, that was used in Waterloo could be applied elsewhere in Canada. And um, the conclusion was really that um, it would be dif different where, you know, depending on where it was applied. Um, so here we have a student population of about 3,500 versus Waterloo's 100,000. And we have more of a rural-based economy. And uh, so I think we need to keep our goals focused and realistic. Um, and we've used this agricultural metaphor. Uh, what we, might we find some low-hanging fruit that we can focus on and start building a buzz around innovation and entrepreneurship at Acadia? And I think, Lee, you've, you've already um, uh, hinted at a couple of these things. Um, is, is there anything else that we we can really, you know, uh, start with first to get just to get things moving? I think so. I, I mentioned a couple. Uh, for example, some of the IT companies at Acadia had very successful relationships uh, with some gaming companies. And uh, so, for example, uh, we recently had discussions with a company from England who was looking to uh, set up shop in Halifax. Very pretty significant shop. Um, they are there, but they need they need students. They need employees. They need co-op students. Um, so they're very interested in having uh, a relationship with Acadia University. And why not come on to campus? And why not get involved in some uh, teaching and curriculum development and, and some research programs with students? So those are the kind of uh, companies we may go after. The knowledge kind of based companies, mm -hmm. who. Um, I think we can be very successful with and take advantage of the fact that they are very, very interested in forming tight relationships with our student body. So that's one area. I, I, the other area I'd like to touch on, uh, Michael, is, is a case, uh, we, this is the case Center for Rural Innovation. And while we want to uh, spin out massively successful companies, that's not going to be the case always. So in addition to trying to help startup companies and entrepreneurs and linking entrepreneurs with innovators, um, and hopefully spinning out some of the university technologies, student and faculty technologies that, that we come across. We want to make sure that we're able to make companies, existing companies, more successful. And that's something we have particular interest in in the Office of Industry and Community Engagement in the Research Office. So if we can help a winery, uh, for example, Benjamin Bridge, we recently worked with them on a new rosé sparkling product. And based on that research project with them, they. They changed the recipe and then it was selected as one of the few wines to go over to the Olympics. So a huge success story. So if we can help companies in our region become more successful, to me that's, that's part of our mandate as well. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'd like to turn the floor over to the audience now. Um, both those of you who have joined us here, right here in the, uh, in the auditorium and uh, those watching us online. Um, people in the auditorium, just go ahead and shout out your questions. We can hear you from here and we'll just repeat them. Um, for the online audience and, and go ahead if you want and tweet um, along with, um, you know, you can tweet from here or you can tweet obviously uh, those watching us online. Remember the, um, the hashtag is uh, dollar startup or pound startup uh, AU, that's startup AU for Acadia University. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience right now? You can target them at any of us or in particular if, um, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Back.
Okay, so the question is how to focus, should we focus on, on uh, or how important it is to focus on just one or two areas or should we be more broadly focused? I think that, am I interpreting that correctly? Okay. Yeah. Maybe I can start. Yeah. Um, Paul, we, uh, when we decided to move ahead with the center, we, we examined what, our, what, what could we offer, what could we bring to the table, and what could we offer to the region. Um, and we keyed in on those key areas of strength within the institution, and there's lots going on in the area as well. Tidal energy is huge for this area, potentially, over the next decade or 20 years. Um, so th that was uh, incredibly important. But the other interesting thing that we've done, and I think another innovative aspect of this center, is that we have not only focused on those areas, we've put researchers in the center in those areas. So we are now not only talking the talk, we're walking the walk. So when companies come into the center, whether they're resident or just require assistance, they have access to researchers in the center. So that is uh, pretty, pretty innovative, almost unheard of. Um, so do we have to focus on those areas? No. We think we can offer uh, a huge value add in those areas, yes. And we feel we can do it more effectively if we have some focus. Because I think your, your comment is correct. We can't be everything to everyone. Yes, Victoria. And maybe just to add to that, I completely agree. And just building on what Duncan said earlier, I think um, uh, what the center has the opportunity to do is to be that place where the students um, at the university can cultivate the, the, the soft skills. And, and, and soft skills, they, they, they evolve, involve everything from sales to marketing mm -hmm. to branding, as you said, and also the science behind the technology. Um, so the thing is, it can be very focused, but at the same time lend itself to developing very broad soft skills um, from the students, and I think that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, Roger. Uh, I just got one. Um, when uh, Victoria started off this uh, discussion, uh, she mentioned seven elements of entrepreneurial communities. And I've heard in the, in the talk about Acadia, a lot of those being mentioned. But the first one she started off with, was um, leadership from entrepreneurs in the community and so forth. I really haven't heard anything about that in the context of talking about the Valley here in Acadia. And actually, um, so my, my question is going to be for two, two-fold here. First of all, I'd like Victoria to say a little bit more about how, you know, in what way entrepreneurs, and, and maybe some examples possibly, of entrepreneurs in the water, Waterloo area, the role they play in building the culture and getting things going and getting the buzz and all that sort of thing. And then maybe some people from the Acadia or the, you know, the Valley side of things, and we have three, obviously, um, could perhaps say, you know, is anything like that happening here? Um, I mean, we do have some uh, examples, I know in the wine industry with some popular people with wineries and so forth, but I don't get a sense that they're possibly playing the role that, right now anyway, that Victoria Okay, I'll, I'll just repeat that. Yeah. I'll just repeat the question online if I can for uh, for those online, I should say. Um, so the question was around the idea of the lead entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs taking the lead in the innovation center um, and looking at examples uh, from the Waterloo area and perhaps how we could um, use this this sort of method at Acadia as well. So I think Victoria, you were going to field the question. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to dance around it a bit because I think there's even better examples that I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, and we always think about Waterloo, and Waterloo is the easy one, but there's amazing things happening across Canada. So I'll give you a few, and some of them are within the university space, and some of them started outside of the university space and inched their way in, and I'll, I'll be very brief and happy to answer questions afterwards as well. So uh, just uh, next door, your neighbors in, 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 uh, in New Brunswick, they have something called the New Brunswick Business Council, and the New Brunswick Business Council are the top, made up of the top entrepreneurs across the province. These guys are worth more than I, I, I can even imagine. Uh, but they've come together in an effort to create a more entrepreneurial um, uh, climate uh, in, in, in the province. They're not work, they, yes, they work with government, yes, they work with universities, but they're really building an ecosystem and an infrastructure themselves. So what they've done most re recently is now they have this Pond de Spande Center. And the Pond de Spande Center, um, and I think there could be an amazing linkage here, um, and so I'm happy to connect you. But, but what they're doing is it really is entrepreneur-led. The, the entrepreneurs at the heart of it are funding the vision. They're, they're saying, this is what we 
need. We need to get this curriculum into schools. This is what we need in order to make our universities more industry relevant and pump out um, uh, and, and, and revitalize our, 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 our ghost towns that, that are emerging because our young people just don't see opportunities here anymore. In, in British Columbia, they took a bit of a different approach. In British Columbia, they have a BC acceleration network. So basically, there's a bunch of accelerators across the province that work with startups and help them to grow really, really quickly. So they get money injected, they get mentors injected really early on. Now, this is a government program, but it was conceptualized by a group of entrepreneurs. And what they've done is, in funding the program, they've put entrepreneurs at the helm of every center, every accelerator program. I don't know how they convinced these guys to take on this, uh, the, to run accelerator centers, but they have ambitious entrepreneurs who are driving change to, for the betterment of their communities on the ground. So that's another way. In Ottawa, where I'm based right now, we have an entrepreneur, his name is Sir Terry Matthews, and he thinks that entrepreneurship ecosystem in Canada is broken and education is broken. And so what he's done is he's now partnered with the University of Ottawa, the University of Waterloo, the University of Carleton, University of Toronto, Ryerson, um, and he takes the, their best and brightest graduates out of second year, and he gets them to build companies out of things he thinks need to be developed because he's recognized a market need. And, and so these really tangible industry-led solutions that entrepreneurs are brainstorming because they see a gap and they see that there's a way to do it. So th that's how I've seen it uh, uh, across the country. But even when I was um, speaking earlier with, with Ian and the building in which we are in now, today, where we're having this panel, I mean, this is an industry um, a donated um, a building, uh, and it's a place to convene, to celebrate, for discourse, for conversation. And so when, um, when, the, when, this, when this building was donated, the donor had a particular view on how this building would be used here on campus. And it's that level of industry leadership we need. But, but we need entrepreneurs just everywhere, infesting every single department across the university and challenging the status quo constantly. Um, so I, I, I guess that would be my answer to your question. There's a lot going on in Canada, um, but I think once you throw entrepreneurs in the mix, uh, as we're seeing here, they, they, they move really, really quickly and they're not happy moving slowly and they're not patient. And that's the kind of people you need to stir up uh, an old and, and tired institution. Exactly what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's, there's um, the tide is turning and there's a change of economic development and how it takes place. And I think the tide is, is, is for a, it's taking place for a number of reasons. One is there's a new breed of entrepreneurs within Nova Scotia. And we're seeing, um, if we look at the dynamic part of, of, of uh, in Halifax and, and, and the surrounding areas, um, a new breed of entrepreneurs that are wanting to engage and give back. And I think the example you use is, you know, put the lower in the elevator to help others. And they're playing a key role, mentoring, guiding, and they're more willing to give their time because they see the advantage of the mentorship and they see the advantage of, of cross-pollinating ideas. And I think that is a, 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 we're seeing that take place. And that's an, a, a very positive thing in Nova Scotia. And I also think there's a real positive thing in terms of how government is looking at how they invest and what their investment strategy is. And they want to engage with industry. And they want to engage with entrepreneurs and, and, and involve entrepreneurs in how they invest in money. And my previous role, uh, I was with ACOA, and the investment strategy changed very drastically even during my time there, where industry and industry involvement was becoming a more of a mandatory type of a facet, as opposed to the previous time. Roger, I know you're, you've been you, you, you've seen changes before, but I think it's a dynamic change, a transformative change that we're seeing already. And, and, and I think as this area takes place and we're at, we're at, it's at its infancy, I think we, we make sure that's a, a, a key element and a kind of one of the, the key pillars to what this takes place is entrepreneurs are, are part of the, the element uh, and the environment of the Innovation Center and the ecosystem. We want to continue involving them and making sure that they're front and center in, in, in every discussion. Mm -hmm. I'll just add, and I'll get you, Duncan as well, maybe you can talk about the agriculture side. Um, there, is, there is a push, I think, from entrepreneurs, um, both within the center and externally, and I think it's maybe subtle, um, part of 
part of where we live and being Nova Scotians and so on. We don't necessarily have the big sugar daddy uh, like they have in New Brunswick. We'll, <laughs> we'll continue to look for that. Um, but there's things happening. There's things happening in agriculture, very exciting things. People are gathering. They're gathering momentum. They're looking for their own investment opportunities, the agriculture sector. The IT sector, for example, we've developed very strong relationships with companies who are pushing us in this direction. They want to get on campus. Uh, we have people like John Reed, Calibri Software, a faculty member who desperately wants a place where he can set up shop. We have other faculty members on campus who have tr haven't traditionally had such a place. So I would argue that we, we do have that entrepreneurial pressure. Maybe it's not this big, again, sugar daddy from above saying, here's, you know, like some the Pond, uh, Des Pondy Center in uh, New Brunswick. But I think we'll get there. It may take us a bit longer, but uh, I think we have the right pieces in place. Duncan, did okay. you want to talk about the agricultural sector a bit? Yeah. Sure. Well, I think, uh, I think a lot of the agriculture sector sort of reflects many other sectors mm -hmm. as a traditional sort of industry. And so traditionally in Nova Scotia, we've been quite dependent on government funding for things like research, um, innovation. We have, we have research centers, but that, that tends to be changing uh, now. You know, a lot, a lot of it's been centralized with the federal government or funds just don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think as an entrepreneurial community, we need to work together to find alternative solutions, whether that's crowdfunding, whether that's CDFs, I don't know. Um, but uh, together, we need to work. Is there anything else you wanted to talk, me to talk about? Okay. Hmm. I get the sense that um, the uh, agricultural focus really makes sense for us here. Um, we are the heart of uh, agriculture in the valley here. and. Uh, it, it just de seems that maybe this is an authentic uh, first a starting point for us. I mean, ICT also makes sense. You can do that anywhere, but we are in an agricultural center, so uh, I, I'm getting the sense that, that, that uh, that's a, an authentic, um, a good starting point for Acadia. Would you, would you all agree that uh, maybe that's really the, the key here, is to focus on our strengths? I think uh, it'll become more... Uh, there'll be a lot more synergy between ICT and agriculture. And so I think we'll see a lot more projects that will be ICT based, but to benefit um, food, food production, uh, food distribution. That's Absolutely, I think that does make sense to get that synergy going, um, sort of a value added to the agricultural process. And that, that's where the ICT can come in for sure. Do we have any questions from Twitter, Duncan? We do. We have one from an alumni. Uh, I believe it's Mike Kennedy. I can never remember his hashtag or his uh, handle. Uh, but it, he asks, how can alumni of Acadia be leveraged to build and sustain momentum? I'll take a first step at that. Um, what we're trying to build now is, is a mentor network. Uh, we have access to the Entrepreneurs Forum. Uh, but we can't say enough about a very strong mentor um, presence in the center and externally. So certainly any alumni who are interested in either being a mentor or a sugar daddy to the center, we'd <laughs> love to hear, <laughs> hear from them. Yeah, I think, you know, we, you, being connected with the university, is, uh, alumni is one of the, the un, probably the best example, untapped assets. And I think the sh the, perhaps one of the weaknesses you mentioned, we have a population of 3,000, uh, uh, 3,700, I guess, now, mm -hmm. which is yeah. wonderful. Um, but it's a small campus. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to look at either a startup, it's about networks. Mm -hmm. And it's about um, making the connections. And, and very, it's very difficult to develop an innovative business or any type of, 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 of any business of any kind if you're in a bubble. And the more that you can tap into ideas and mentorship, whether it's technical or business strategies, that's a real synergy. And you know, when you're in, in big urban areas where uh, synergies perhaps link up easier and, and quicker, it's a lot of times because of kind of in informal um, uh, networks that create. And, and it's not hard to get a relationships and a network through relationships and dynamic uh, um, partnerships. And that's the type of thing that uh, tapping into alumni, that's, that's a real asset that startups, especially with students and, and, and connections, that um, we should be able to, fo we should be working hard to foster. I think it's a real dynamic uh, opportunity. Hmm. You bring up the, the idea of networks. Now, personal networks, 
Um, we have face-to-face -face and now we have social networks. Duncan, do you want to comment on the value maybe of one versus the other? Are they both important, do you think? Or is one more important than the other at this point for us? I think they're both absolutely important. You know, uh, sitting down for coffee with someone is, is a much different experience to emailing them. Um, but uh, connecting with alumni who uh, perhaps are in Shanghai or, you know, all these places around the world, um, you need you need these tools. Um, so uh, I have a mentor I've been connecting with. Uh, he was in Shanghai for five years. That's why I mentioned Shanghai. He's back in Montreal, and I met him uh, l last week. And uh, it was the first time I'd met him face to face in two years of knowing him. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, uh, one back. This is directed towards Victoria. Uh, being a student myself, I find it difficult sometimes to get students to be involved in opportunities such as this. Um, how can we, as a university and community, motivate students to play in the game? Oh, that's that's the question of the day, and I, I I think it's fantastic that you asked that, and and that's really my background is student entrepreneurship. That's the, I I have a, such a passion for that. So we'll just have you repeat the question for the, uh, yeah, the Twitter sure. or um, the live feed. Do you yeah. want to repeat it? Or? Oh no, if you could. Uh, summarize. Well, the question was, you know, um, how do we get students involved and energized around this agenda, and how do we get them involved? Um, uh, and supporting and getting involved in the center and the movement and student entrepreneurship on, on, on campus. Um, and uh, I shared this this morning in Halifax. I was speaking at the Atlantic Dreams Festival. And I think it's all about moments in time, really. And, and what we need to do is create um, and, and, and look at every moment in time that a student interacts with the, with the university. And when they first start, they get their orientation kit and they might go into an orientation. Right there and then, that's the time to put entrepreneurial alumni front and center and show the impact that they've made on their community and the world. What, what the re I, I didn't know about entrepreneurship. My, my, my dad's a welder. My mom is an, a, an administrator in an office. I had no idea about entrepreneurship growing up. Uh, media doesn't talk about entrepreneurship. They talk about politics. So I thought that the only way you could change the world was through politics. But, but when I came across entrepreneurship, it was I, I, went, I went for my master's at Oxford University. And part of our orientation, we had great alumni standing in front of us who, who had changed the world. They might not have been entrepreneurs, but they were certainly entrepreneurial and resourceful. But then um, I went to a freshers' fair. I don't know if, we, if you have this um, at Acadia University with all of the clubs and societies. So the business club would be there and the arts club. But, but when, when I walked in, the entrepreneurs' club was huge. Like It was so colorful and energetic. And they weren't showing pictures of Donald Trump or Kevin O'Leary or you know that, that type of entrepreneur. They showed pictures of Muhammad Yanis. They showed pictures of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., people who had entrepreneurial traits who were changing the world and people who that I could relate to and whose society can relate to. And I think it's about in, inspiring people at that individual level, but I, I, nothing beats leading by example. So as a student yourself, looking to energize other students, your passion is absolutely going to come through when you talk about entrepreneurship and evangelize it. I think that the best thing that you could do is say, I, I, I'm an entrepreneurial supporter, and wave the entrepreneurship flag. And you'll be amazed how many people will flock to you. Even today, I hope that any students here who are interested in entrepreneurship just embark upon you to, to be able to talk about how to start creating that culture of student enterprise here on campus. Because w once you develop that, you create an unparalleled network. And I'll just finish on this, this comment here about student entrepreneurship. When I was doing my undergrad at Ottawa U, I didn't know what a St. Francis Xavier was. I had no idea. All I knew were that there were people with trendy rings walking around with St. Francis Xavier. When I went and I did backpacking across the world, I met people with these trendy rings, St. Francis Xavier. I had no idea it was in Canada even. I just knew St. Francis Xavier, really cool university. You needed to be part of this club. They had some sort of uh, wink, wink, knob, knob, you know, kind of thing going. But there was a strong culture and fellowship amongst the students. And you can feel that. And then when I had the opportunity to visit the campus, you feel that on campus. And, and I think that, that that's the kind of spirit we need to invest in, in all of our campuses across country. And if that can be principled, principled upon entrepreneurship, I think we're going to have um, a powerful generation that's going to take this country to a new level. 
But I think that was exactly the right question, and I hope that entrepreneurial young people in the room today um, uh, come and talk to you, because if you want to start a, an entrepreneurship club, you want to work more heavily with the business school, if you want to connect with Lee, if you want to connect with Duncan, um, if, if you want to connect with anyone, do it, because you're going to find people who want to help you, because that's the missing piece, getting students leading in this charge on campus. So well done. Good answer, Victoria. Uh, I think we had another question over there somewhere. Yes. Well, I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, ecosystems change, and you know, over time, the valley um, is economy is becoming more orientated towards the hub. I mean, Halifax is becoming a bigger, more dynamic city, and I think the opportunity now with technology, with logistics, is to play a bigger role. To how do we fit into the growth center of the dynamic change that's taking place in Nova Scotia, which is the growth of Halifax. So I think as a, as a community, we have to start looking at, well, how does that take place? And how do we add to what's ta the buzz that's taking place in Halifax? And Acadia and the Innovation Center is a way of, is a way of doing it. Um, they, are, they have growth in a number of dynamic sectors. ICT is a dy dynamic sector. Um, you know the, the, the computer science school, we're, we're one of the only schools that have it. So there's a synergy there that I think, you know, partnership uh, can, can take place. Uh, we do agri-food, well, they're an agri-food market. So I think that's the tie-in that we're starting to, more and more of our activities is orientated towards um, that market as opposed to perhaps just focusing on the Annapolis Valley as a uh, St. Croix to, uh, to Digby. We're aligning ourselves more in the opportunity to spend more time as that economic zone is, is changing. And economic zones are changing, you know, with, with transportation and logistics and, 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 and commun different communications. We can do business differently. I would say we could even go a little bit further and, and, and you know, we have global reach now. Yeah, fact, absolutely. Uh, certainly for the ICT industry. Um, any final questions coming in from Twitter, Duncan? Yeah, we have one, one more. Um, have you looked at affiliations? I'm assuming they're referring to the Innovation Center. Um, Mars, e.g. Mars, um, already has existing incubators members. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, Acadia's Office of Industry and Community Engagement is linked to the Springboard Network within Atlantic Canada. So we, uh, within a phone call, we're tied into all of the Atlantic Canadian universities in Atlantic Canada as well as the incubation centers. There aren't that many, um, but for example, the Genesis Group at Memorial. We're also through Springboard tied into all the other networks through Canada, including Mars. Uh, similarly, we're, uh, InnovaCore is our partner. InnovaCore currently runs four, three? three? Three other incubation facilities. And I use the word incubation, I hate to do that, because we're, we consider ourselves, we would term ourselves much broader um, as a hub for the region, so whether you're resident or not. But in terms of incubation, yeah, we have, Novacore is our partner, and we have access to pretty significant expertise. We're also a member of the Canadian Association for Business Incubators, so we are tapping into a pretty wide range. Okay, uh, one more question. So just to repeat for the uh, online, um, so the idea is that 
are we creating a center for uh, those businesses outside or perhaps within the um, agriculture, food and wine, but within the community that wouldn't have a brick and mortar place to do business? Are, are we creating that kind of hub as well? And that's a great question, and thank you. Um, yes, we, a part of the center, part of our mandate is to really provide services throughout southwest Nova Scotia, but beyond as well. Part of the center is called the hoteling space. So that'll be open space uh, with uh, access to you know, wireless and hardwired internet where people can come for an hour or come for a day or maybe set up shop for a couple of weeks who may need the space for perhaps they want to just have a meeting within our meeting room, perhaps they want to have a meeting with a faculty member or use some of the facilities on campus or access some of the commercialization or, or support services within the research office. Um, but I think when I say innovation hub, one of the key things that we're going to add to the larger community is the programming. So it's not the incubation space. I, I really believe this, and it'll be interesting when Victoria visits us a couple of years from now, how successful we are. But we want to offer programming that's of value to our region. When I say programming, it could be, it could be how to write a business plan, maybe, but it may be more specific. It's maybe for value-added food producers, it's what type of packaging is appropriate, how do you price products. Um, nutritional analysis, those kind of technical services as well. So I think those are the kind of things that are going to be key to the region. And when I, so when I say innovation hub, the, the programming is a key element of that. Okay, thanks, Lee. Um, we'll have to wrap it up now. Um, thanks uh, again for, uh, for helping us uh, uh, look into this um, timely and important issue. Um, our panel today has been uh, Victoria Lennox, CEO of Startup Canada, Paul Richards, Business Development Consultant at Innovacorp, Lee Hustis, Director of Industry and Community Engagement at Acadia, and Duncan Ibada, Senior Marketing Student, Entrepreneur and Coordinator at the Acadia Center for Rural Innovation. So on behalf of the uh, Manning School of Business, Acadia University, I would like to thank you all for participating. Let's keep the conversation going, both in person and online. <laughs>